On a cold November morning of 1290, deep in the southern lordship of Gower, Wales, William the Scabby was led out to the scaffold on which he was to be hanged. A rebel against the Anglo-Norman rule, he had been sentenced to death on 13 counts of homicide. Now it was time for him to meet his maker, except that's not how the story ends. For though William was hanged until dead, he was not to stay as such, and later in the day, his miraculous resurrection was witnessed by a large proportion of the population of Swansea, including the highly experienced executioner himself. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello, welcome to Dark Histories. I am Ben, and this is Season 3, Episode 15. We're going way, way back today with a really interesting tale from like the 14th century, very early 14th, kind of 13th stroke 14th century. Everybody loves a bit of the Middle Ages, right? Interestingly, I actually had two episodes that I was researching for this week's episode, and uh, I I couldn't quite decide which one I was going to sort of spring for, so I was researching two in parallel, and then... um, I got some books sent to me from a listener uh, called DJ. So thanks, DJ. Um, and one of the books that he sent me just, I instantly just thought, oh, yeah, actually, I want to do this. So at the very last minute, with about three days left to go, I benched the other two episodes and, and just kind of nailed this one. It's a cracker of an episode. I hope you enjoy it. Before we get there, I want to say thanks to all the new Patreon subscribers, as usual. We've got Shannon and not so Cape Crusader. Nadine, Notorious Narratives, Mary, Truly, Jay Southern, Crystal, Anne, and Indy. Thanks very much for signing up. It's really good help, um, as always. And thank you to all the patrons and everyone who supports the show in all the ways you support it. Um, Yeah, otherwise, that's kind of it this week. There's not much to sort of bang on about. So without further ado, this is the story of William Cray, the Not-So-Hanged Man. The Gower Peninsula, part of the county of Glamorgan, with the city of Swansea to the east, lies in the heart of southern Wales, extending out westward into the Bristol Channel. In 1106, during the Norman expansion into Wales, the Welsh ruler of the parish was killed and Norman castles sprung up along the coastline, numbering over 20 by 1116. This included the four-and-a-half-acre stone fortress of Swansea, built by Henry de Beaumont, one of the first lords to establish themselves in southeast Wales and one of the largest Anglo-Norman baronial families. After the Earl of Warwick died in 1184, the land passed back into the hands of the royals. Despite a long period of tumultuous war and rebellion, by the late 12th century in the reign of Henry II, both the Normans and Welsh were keen to negotiate a fragile form of peace, with the Normans settling for occupying the southern principalities creating a series of lordships, including that of Gower. His lordships were not simply geographical divides in the country, and the reality on the ground was a series of complicated districts that teetered on the edge of constant rebellion and uprising. Gower itself was divided ministerially into two halves, with the lower southwestern area, named English Gower, and the upper northeastern, known as Welsh Gower. Welsh Gower was further split into the areas of Upper and Lower Wood, and whilst the divide generally saw the English occupy the English Gower and the Welsh occupy the Welsh Gower, native Welsh still lived and worked in both areas alongside the influx of English peasant farmers who transformed the agricultural landscape and the townsmen who took up residence in Swansea. This delicate arrangement coasted in relative peace until Henry II died in 1189, Within the year, the Welsh had taken up arms once more, and rebellions sprung up throughout the lordships. In Gower, Swansea came under siege in 1192, until eventually the threat of the incoming Anglo-Norman forces pushed them to retreat. It was in this fraught landscape of fragile peace, ethnic division, bitter rebellion and constant war that Gower passed into the hands of William de Brose, when it was granted to him by King John in 1203. William de Brose hailed from Brose in southern Normandy and embarked into England with the Norman invasion led by William the Conqueror. 
The invasion saw him rewarded with land spread throughout southern English counties, including Berkshire, Dorset, Hampshire, Surrey, Wiltshire, and a considerable chunk of Sussex, with the lands of Bramber, a centre of salt production and an economically important area. He built Bramber Castle in 1070, overlooking the River Adur, and towering over the 150 peasant families that lived within its shadow. With careful marriages and continual economic expansion, the de Bros family flourished alongside the Norman invasion. In 1203, when the current head of the family, William, was granted Gower, the family was at its most powerful, expanding its influence throughout southern England and now deep into the Welsh lordships. It was not to last, however, and William de Bros was exiled just five years later in 1208, whilst his wife and children were imprisoned and starved, all by the same King John that had earlier so elevated him with the control of Gower. Over time, the family eventually reclaimed control when John de Brost, the only surviving male heir, took control over the lordships of Bramber and Gower. He retained control of the lands until his death in 1232 when he died from a fall from a horse and control passed to his son, William de Brost, in 1241 when he came of age. For the next 50 years, William ruled the lordships and became once again one of the most powerful barons of the English kingdom. It was a period of some security, however it was not without its troubles, as we have heard. With the constant battles, both local and national, with rebellious uprisings in Gower, and battles for the king during the Barons' War, where the king sought to regain authority over the aristocracy that had placed restraints upon his government, ending in his death at the Battle of Lewis in 1264. William de Brose had taken the side of the defeated royalists in this particular skirmish and his four-year-old son was captured and held hostage as a consequence until the defeat and dismemberment of Simon de Montfort, the leader of the baronial opposition. As royal authority slowly restored throughout the kingdom, the de Brose family once again returned to ruling their lands in Gower and Bramber, with the usual ebb and flow of violence and peace, occupation and revolt, that had so become the metronomic nature of the day. Despite the special status of the lords throughout the Welsh principalities that saw them as powerful as most kings, life was not particularly peaceful. 1287 saw a particularly violent surge of rebellion, led by Reset Maradid, a native Welsh outlaw who had been in a long dispute with the English after a host of financial and land disputes had festered alongside a growing feeling of resentment against English rule. This eventually led him to bring a force against Gower, besieging Swansea for almost two weeks. Though the force was pushed back, they left the township plundered and the castle burned alongside several other castles along the coast that they had rolled over as they ploughed down through Gower, picking up Welsh natives who were living in Gower along the way. He came down into Gower in the month of June with a great many and joined to him the Welshmen of that area who lived in the upper wood. In that same month, by their counsel, he burned the town of Swansea, and a few days later descended on the noble manor of Oystermouth, which the brave knight Sir William de Bros had built for himself, and I do not know whether by force or by fraud, he captured the castle there. Of the men who were taken prisoner, some he commanded to be killed in his presence, others he led off captive. The rebellion was eventually crushed and Rhys at Meredith fled to the cover of the forests where he lived as an outlaw until his capture and death in 1292 by native Welshmen who were rewarded with land. This was an act which shows the complicated nature of the precarious living situation in the Welsh lordships. One of the native Welshmen who joined forces with Rhys as he steamrolled down through Gower was a peasant farmer named William Cray. Whilst he had enjoyed some freedom after the failed rebellion, he was eventually captured and incarcerated in 1290, charged with arson and 13 counts of homicide for his part in the siege of Swansea and Oystermouth. Now, on the 26th of November, as he sat in a communal jail cell in Swansea Castle, he prayed for his life on the eve of his execution. At the time of William Craig's incarceration, hanging was the primary method for execution throughout England. Of the 98 prisoners executed between the years 1389 to 1392, 68 were hanged, 14 were burned at the stake, 12 were decapitated, 3 were buried alive, and 1 was boiled in a cauldron. This list might sound brutal in itself, but the short form only tells half the story. 
During this period of civil unrest and rebellion, executions were becoming more gruesome, fueled by a drive to send a message mixed with considerable feelings of revenge with every new uprising. Not simply strung up and then buried, many of the executed were dragged to the gallows tied to a horse and once the hanging was done, their bodies were cut down and quartered with each piece sent to the far reaches of the land to be displayed as a warning to others. Heads of the treasonous were routinely spiked and displayed for months on end within London itself. Even in a relatively clean hanging that would forego the disembowelings, decapitations, burnings and removal of hearts and other various organs, the process was not pretty. The drop, a collapsible floor on the gallows, was not invented until the 18th century, so prisoners were hauled up on the gallows by ropes or turned off of ladders or cartwheels. An 18th century hanging might have been a swift death as the neck would usually break from the jolt of the drop, but without such a device, a lengthy, drawn-out strangulation was par for the course. This brutal death penalty was rolled out more and more as the Norman invasion of England spread across the country. William the Conqueror was keen to show that he was not a man to be trifled with, and the death penalty was passed down not just for crimes such as poaching, murder and rebellion, but also for repeat offenders of lesser crimes. It was possible to pay off the debt to the king and avoid an execution. The going price for the pardon of a noble was 63 cows, less for people of the lower classes. Aside from this payment, there were two other ways to avoid an execution in medieval England. The first was to gain pardon, often petitioned to the Lord's wife. Lords may have been seen as harsh or maintaining their rule with an iron fist, but their wives were often thought of as the more gentle and compassionate members of the baronial hierarchy. Not wanting to seem out of step with their class, the petitions were often upheld and executions were, at times, pardoned after the request of a lady to the Lord, who held the final say in upholding the Lord the land. The second way out of an execution was a little more complicated. If you were hanged and the gallows or rope was to break, it was at times viewed as an act of divine intervention and the prisoner would then be pardoned. There was some debate over this, as well as the level of importance given to the clause in a sentence that said the prisoner was to be hanged until dead. A sentence with this tag to the end could be seen to mean exactly that, no matter what might happen along the way. Nevertheless, this was one final desperate ray of hope for a prisoner who faced the gallows. On the eve of his execution, William Craig had already been imprisoned and questioned in Swansea Castle by William de Brose for 15 days. He was, by his own admission, unsure of his age, but thought around 45 years old. Known as William the Scabby in English, he was described at the time as a poor man living with his kinsfolk because his land was taken away from him by his lord. As heard, he stood accused of arson and 13 counts of homicide. Not only were the accusations serious enough in themselves, but he was captured as a rebel after one of the most violent uprisings against the Lordship of Gower in recent times, that had seen much of the Lord's lands pillaged and properties burned and plundered. He had been petitioned for pardon and offered the price of 100 cows for his freedom, as well as a direct pardon sent to Lady Mary de Brose. William de Brose, however, refused pardon on both counts. Lady Mary described William Craig as a renowned brigand, but the reality was much darker for Craig. The rebellion he had taken part in was pushed back only three years prior and would still have been very fresh in the mind of William de Brose. This execution would have enacted a certain degree of revenge for the Lord, and to pardon Craig in such a way would have shown a degree of leniency that was uncharacteristic of the time to an almost absurd degree. Combined with the fact that the leader of the rebellion had escaped into the forests of South Wales and was yet to be captured, William Craig's coming execution was the epitome of a statement execution. Combined with feelings of revenge, his was a sentence that had little chance of pardon. At 7.30am on the 26th of November 1290, William Craig was led out from Swansea Castle down to the gallows that stood on a hill outside of town. The structure was a makeshift design, consisting of upright lengths of lumber hammered into the ground with a crossbeam resting upon the top. The noose was already tied around his neck and he was made to carry the length of rope that would string him up, with his family following behind. In a particular act of brutal barbarism, 
William de Brose had forced Craig's own family to hang their relative themselves. As he approached the gallows, he spoke to the chaplain that accompanied the party. Though unable to understand Welsh and Craig unable to speak English, Latin or French, his pleas fell on deaf ears. The procession was quite the show of force and included William Craig, his family, the local chaplain, William de Brose and ten armed guards on horseback along with the executioner who was there to hang the second prisoner to be executed on that day. When they reached the gallows, William Craig was to be hanged first, and he was ordered to climb the ladder carried from the castle and propped up against the structure. His rope was tied and the ladder handed to the care of his relatives, who were to turn him off by quite literally turning the ladder away from the structure until Craig would fall and hang. With the job done, attention was turned to the second man to be hanged, He was hoisted up over the crossbeam, and the two men were left to hang until sunset upon orders of William de Brose. However, shortly after the execution was completed, the gallows collapsed under the weight of the second man, and they both fell heavily to the ground. Here we are reminded of the pardon clause due to the possibility of divine intervention. No such concern was shown by Lord de Brose though, and the second man was ordered to be taken away and buried. Despite both men being reported as dead, Craig was ordered to be hung up once again and to hang until sunset due to his being a very famous and public malefactor and as such the Lord decided that it was best to hang him twice as an insult to his kin. His body was once more hauled up over one of the upright beams, tied off and left to hang until the evening. When he was eventually let down at 4pm that afternoon, His body was placed upon the ladder that he had earlier climbed and been turned off to his death and carried into town where he was placed in the house of a local man, Thomas Matthews, who lived next door to what would be his final destination in the church of St Mary. As his body was placed in the house, William de Broche Jr. came down from the castle to see the corpse for himself, describing it as such. He was laying by the main door, stretched out on the ground in the way that a dead man lies. His whole face was black and in parts bloody or stained with blood. His mouth, neck and throat and the parts around them and also his nostrils were filled with blood so that it was impossible in the natural course of things for him to breathe air through his nostrils or through his mouth or through his throat. His tongue hung out of his mouth, the length of a man's finger and it was completely black and swollen and as thick with the blood sticking to it that it seemed the size of a man's two fists together. Further witness description told of how in his death throes he had voided his bladder and bowels and of how both of his eyes had popped loose from their socket. It was whilst his body lay in the house of Thomas Matthews that things began to take a turn towards something a little more strange. Back in the ladies' chamber of Swansea Castle, Lady Mary de Brose had, after having her request for pardon denied by her husband, been praying for divine intervention to spare William Craig during his execution. Now, upon return of William de Brose Jr. and following his report on the state of the dead body, she insisted, This man has been hanged twice and has suffered a great penalty. Let us pray to God and St. Thomas de Cantaloupe that he give him life and, if he give him life, we will conduct him to St. Thomas. A trusted advisor to King Edward I and a raging anti-Semite, in life, Thomas de Cantaloupe had petitioned the king to expel Jews from the kingdom, claiming they were enemies of God and rebels against the faith. He had previously campaigned to stop ethnic Jews from being given positions of authority in society. At the time of his death, on the 25th of August 1282, he was in a state of excommunication by the Archbishop of Canterbury and was travelling in Italy towards Rome where he planned to take up the matter with the Pope. After his death, His flesh was boiled from his bones which were sent back to England and made to rest. Though in 1287 they were removed from the grave and transported to Hereford Cathedral where he had previously been appointed as bishop. This move effectively canonised him within the local community in all but official sense. Thomas de Cantaloupe was not however a de facto saint and he had not been recognised as such by the Pope. Though since his remains were placed in the tomb, Local hearsay had spread rumours of numerous miracles being performed after pilgrimages to the cathedral. We have heard that the blind recover their sight there, the lame walk and the dead rise again. 
This reporting of miracles, helped along by Richard de Swinniford, the incoming bishop that replaced Thomas after his death, had led to a recent pilgrim cult forming around Hereford and Thomas de Cantaloupe's tomb, and as such, it would have been fairly natural for Lady de Brose, familiar with the area and, as it turned out, a distant relative, to have chosen this particular dead bishop as the target for her prayers. As part of the prayers and invocation of the saint, Lady Mary sent one of her handmaidens to the house of Thomas Matthews to measure the body of William Craig with a piece of string. This was a religious practice common in medieval England, whereby a body would be measured lengthwise with a piece of thread. This thread or string would then be dipped into wax to make a taper the same length of the person in need of the saintly help. This was all done in the hopes of attracting their attention to the request. They also bent a penny in Thomas de Cantaloupe's name, another religious practice in the invocation of saints, where the invoker would quite literally bend the soft silver of a penny. After all the invocations and pleading to Thomas de Cantaloupe, the body of William Craig lay lifeless and still on the floor of the Swansea household. To all onlookers, he was as dead in the evening as he was when he was pulled from the gallows and transported to town. At least, that was until around the middle of the night. After he had been measured, not immediately, but after an hour or so, William Craig moved his tongue a little, and after another space of time, moved a foot, and afterwards gradually began to recover strength in his limbs. If the breaking of the gallows were not enough to convince some that there had been a level of divine intervention into his execution, his miraculous resurrection surely did the trick. Unfortunately, the miracle had not extended to bringing him back to life in prime condition, and several witnesses stated that for days after the execution, he continued to look dreadfully unwell. Lady Mary de Brose, upon hearing of the success of her invocation of the saint, nursed him for four days herself, bringing porridge to the house for him every day. He struggled to speak for the first days of his new life, which was a shame because he had quite a story to tell of his execution, and when he did regain command of his speech, he told of how a vision of a bishop dressed in white had supported his feet on the gallows. Through speaking with Lady Mary and confirming that she had invoked Thomas the Cantaloupe in his death, it seemed best to William to agree that in this case, the bishop who had helped him on the scaffold must also have been Thomas. After ten days, with his recovery going well, Lady Mary set about a pilgrimage to Hereford Cathedral on horseback, accompanied by her son, William de Brose Jr., and William Craig, who walked behind their horses barefoot, with the noose from his execution around his neck. It was a three-day trek, and once they reached the tomb in early December and had given their thanks to the local saint, the group parted ways, with William Craig telling the Brose family he was planning on continuing his pilgrimage to the Holy Land. If the story were to end here, we might consider it a fireside story, perhaps stuffed with rumour and hearsay that had eventually become ingrained as law in the local and surrounding area. However, there is another chapter to this supposed miraculous resurrection that transcends it from a local story to one with an international platform that would see its subject of rigorous investigation. During the latter half of the 11th century, the popes decided that it was necessary to restrict the authority regarding canonization to the sole judgment of the pope, though it would take several centuries for the law to be entirely adhered to. To this end, in the event of a written application, including reference to virtue, character and miracles worked, was sent to the Pope and accepted, a council was set up made up of high-ranking members of the church who would question witnesses and investigate claims of miracles. The entire process was recorded for latter perusal in Rome, where the decision would be made on whether or not to officially canonise the subject as a saint. This process would often take decades with over 50% of canonization requests during the Middle Ages never reaching a conclusion due to being bogged down by the sheer amount of bureaucracy involved. And so it was with the canonization of Thomas de Cantaloupe, whose inquiry began in the summer of 1307, 17 years after the miraculous resurrection of William Cray. The matter of his excommunication had to be settled to allow the papal inquiry to begin. It was quickly found that upon investigation, the Archbishop of Canterbury that had enacted the excommunication was thought to be vindictive towards Thomas, 
and further, he had already been absolved before his death during his visit to Rome. With the matter wrapped up neatly, the inquiry could begin proper. The questions for the inquiry were grouped into three main categories, faith, life and character, reputation, public report and opinion, and miracles. These were all seen over by three ecclesiastics, William Durand, the Bishop of Mend in the south of France, Ralph Baldock, the Bishop of London, and William de Tester, the Archdeacon of Iran in the Diocese of Cummings. All three were university-trained men in the School of Law. The inquiry was held in St. Catherine's Chapel in Hereford and began on the 28th of August, 1307. One of the very first miracles to be investigated by the Council was that of the resurrection of William Craig. Three witnesses were called to the inquiry, Lady Mary de Brose, William de Brose Jr. and William of Coddenston, the chaplain that had overseen the execution. William de Brose Sr. had died five weeks after the execution in early January of 1291. All three gave evidence in French and though there were some discrepancies over the exact timing of the hanging, their stories were more or less in line with one another. They all told of the execution and of seeing William Craig dead after his arrival in the house of Thomas Matthews. His eyes had come out of his sockets and his teeth were clenched so tight that some of William's relatives who were there were unable to open his mouth. There was some question over how the execution had taken place and the method of hanging which William de Brose was more than happy to explain. The method of hanging men in this country is such that the hanged men die immediately after the hanging. A noose with a slip knot is placed around their necks and the knot of the noose is at the back of their necks so that they are suffocated at once. The chaplain told the panel of how he had heard the story from William Craig of the bishop assumed to be Thomas de Cantaloupe who had supported his feet during the execution. It was customary, he went on to explain, that if any error or trickery was found to have been enacted during the execution process by the executioner, he himself would be hanged. The questions, though probing into the details of the execution and resurrection, were fairly straightforward, and all three witnesses gave evidence that matched the accepted tale of the day. They all stated that they had no direct contact with William Craig after the pilgrimage, with the Debrose family assuming he went off to the Holy Land, as he said. But they had heard that he had died of natural causes sometime in 1305, two years prior to the inquiry. In conclusion, Lady Mary stated to the inquiry that she did not believe, nor did she know of, and had not heard anyone stating that he could have lived without a divine miracle above nature. Likewise, William de Brose Jr. similarly confirmed that I do not believe William Craig could have escaped death through the powers or force of human nature. And the chaplain too, he said simply and directly that it could not have been possible without a miracle. After their questioning, the three witnesses were dismissed and the inquiry into the life of Thomas de Cantaloupe continued. The miraculous resurrection of William Craig was just one of 38 posthumous miracles that had been attributed to Thomas de Cantaloupe and that all needed to be investigated. Nevertheless, Several weeks later, when witnesses 148 through 153 were called to give their statements and answer the panel's questions regarding the William Craig case, a rather surprising group showed up in the cathedral, ready to give testimony. On this occasion, the nobles and chaplain were overlooked and instead saw witnesses made up of local men who had attended the execution and lived in the area. First up was Thomas Marshall, a local priest who had lived in Swansea. John of Bagaham was present, the executioner on the day of the execution. Henry de Tanner, a freeman who, at the time of his execution, had been one of the group of ten armed guard on horseback who were drafted to oversee the events. There was also Adam of Loghorn, a freeman who had watched the execution from the town wall, and Johann of Howell, another freeman. Lastly, and without a doubt most surprisingly, was William Craig himself. He was apparently not quite as dead, once again, as the de Brose family had thought. He was still very much alive, and as far as John of Bagoham knew, he had been living back in Gower since soon after his pilgrimage to Hereford. Three of the witnesses gave testimony in English, two in French, and only one, William Craig, in Welsh. This caused some confusion at first, 
though after a small difficulty, two further interpreters were drafted in to translate and record the questions put to him from the council. The questioning of the witnesses, once again, went much the same as before, with everyone confirming the general story. All witnesses confirmed that he was hanged in front of a decent crowd, who rejoiced greatly, for William had frequently been the leader of many evildoers, and that when he was pulled down, he had according to John of Bagaham the executioner, as much life as a stone. It became quickly apparent that John of Bagaham was not overly impressed by the entire affair. When speaking of Lady Mary and her invocation of the saint, he said that he did not know why she did it, and that though he did not agree with her position on the matter, he went along with her orders on the day. She was rejoicing about an evil thing, for it was evil that an evil man should be brought back to life. One of the hang-ups on the veracity of the story of the hanging of William Craig raises itself when considering the actual date of the execution. During the inquiry for canonization, many of the dates given were different depending on the witness. This was perhaps understandable given the 17 years that had passed since the hanging and the inquiry itself. It became further understandable when viewed through the lens of the medieval perspective of the passage of time. None of the nine witnesses that had given evidence concerning the resurrection of William Craig gave the date using the Anno Domini system, that being 1290, but instead they gave the date using the amount of time that had passed, landmarked by various religious feasts and festivals, for example giving the date of the hanging as 15 years or more past at the Feast of St James. This was a common method for discussing time throughout the general medieval population and it extended to both the passage of time as well as spatial distance. Much like one might today say that a particular city is a two-hour drive away, in medieval England, distance was calculated on the amount of days it would take to travel at normal speed. This measurement gave a unit of time that was generally understood and could be scaled down to fit the situation. Thus, in the account of the hanging of William Craig, do we read that he walked about the distance of two crossbow shots from the prison to the gallows, and once there he was hanged for as long as it takes to walk a quarter mile at normal pace. When viewed through this perspective, the lack of alarm raised by the inquiry concerning the contradicting dates becomes slightly better understood. Overall, however, there are only minor inconsistencies in their stories, which were largely overlooked by the council and not followed up with extra questioning. One of the larger changes in the story, however, was from the testimony of William Cray, who told of how he had no memory of the bishop holding his feet on the scaffold at all. His last memory was climbing onto the ladder, and then he fell unconscious until he woke the next day in the house of Thomas Matthews. Instead, he told of a story of seeing the Virgin Mary in his prison cell on the morning of his execution, and of how she had told him that Thomas de Cantaloupe would come to his aid. This dramatic shift in story may well have held significance, but once again, the council didn't probe too deeply upon the matter. When they questioned William, they did inspect his neck, but found no trace of the execution, though he did show the council a scar on the end of his tongue which, he claimed, had come from biting down on it so hard during the hanging. Once more, the witnesses were dismissed, and the inquiry continued on, concerned with other matters. The report of the inquiry was completed and sent to Rome, where it was reviewed by a group of cardinals in 1313, and eventually, in 1320, Pope John XXII officially canonised Thomas de Cantaloupe as a saint. Curiously, of the 38 posthumous miracles examined in the inquiry, only 26 were accepted to be examined by the Pope, whilst a further 12 were thrown out, and hundreds were simply ignored. Of the 12 that were thrown out, the miraculous resurrection of William Craig was one, and was never accepted by the papacy as a bona fide miracle. However, they did give no reasoning for this decision in the report. When considering the story of William Craig, we are left with several unanswered questions and several mysteries. First and foremost is the resurrection of William Craig. Had he really been brought back to life by St. Thomas? If, as we should be, we remain sceptical on the subject of divine intervention, how then did William survive? Then there is the question of why Lady Mary de Brose took such an interest in saving William Craig in the first place. Concerning the hanging itself, Summarising an essay written by Christian Kreutzel on Scandinavian miracle stories, 
Historian Jussi Hanske suggests that William was simply not dead at all, writing on the subject of death in the Middle Ages as such. There were no sure and generally accepted signs of death, save in a few obvious cases, such as plague victims, but there were two common ways of establishing that a person was indeed dead. The first one was simply to wait and see if signs of life appeared over the course of time. The second one was public opinion. Although in the case of William Craig there was a considerable number of witnesses who had claimed to have seen William dead, none have any solid evidence other than the fact that he voided his bladder and bowels on the gallows, which, at the time, was considered to be only something which would happen when one was as good as dead. Though each witness did state symptoms which, when added together, would certainly see him considered as dead even by modern medical standards, none have anything outside of hearsay and local gossip. One could question the honesty of the members of the inquest itself. Were they perhaps prone to tall tales, or would they wish to bolster the evidence of miracles in order to see Thomas made a saint? Justi Hansker, again in the same paper, addresses this quite directly. The Hereford proctors were naturally keen to produce the best possible evidence to support the case of Thomas de Cantaloupe. It seems, however, that they were not producing forged evidence and false witnesses. The testimonies of different witnesses have too many differences between them to have been invented by the proctors. Furthermore, some witnesses called by the proctors even deny any knowledge of the miracle itself. Had they been briefed to produce false testimonies, they would probably have told detailed stories of the miracle so that there would have been no room for doubt. There is no positive evidence that the proctors in this case or any other miracle attributed to Thomas de Cantaloupe would have produced manipulated evidence. One other possibility is that William Craig, who gave evidence in the inquiry, was perhaps an imposter. Although there may well have been motivation to insert an imposter as a witness on behalf of the Hereford Cathedral, after all, if they could have a legitimised saint lying in their tombs to act as a site of pilgrimage, it would almost definitely bring a great deal of wealth to the cathedral. That said, however, there appears to be no evidence that the William Craig who appeared before the inquiry was anyone else but the man himself. Against the fact would be that anyone who were to be drafted in as an imposter would have had to have been meticulously briefed on the events of the execution due to the extent of the questioning. Several of the other witnesses who testified at the same time also positively identified the man as William Craig under a sworn oath on the Gospels, an oath which, at the time, was not something discarded lightly. So what of William's dramatic change of story from being supported on the gallows by a bishop clad in white robes to a vision of the Virgin Mary? It seems not unlikely that the original story told by William, that of the bishop supporting his feet, was a tall tale to help him avoid a second hanging. Tales of divine intervention by having a religious figure support one as they were hanged were not uncommon, and it's almost guaranteed that William Craig would have heard of at least one such tale in his lifetime, either at a religious sermon or through gossip and hearsay, or equally likely, both. During the inquiry, he mentions himself that he feared a second hanging, and so, did he perhaps invent the story at the time of his resurrection to tie in with Lady Mary's tale of invocation in order to further bolster the likelihood that his survival had been a saintly miracle and therefore lessen the chance of any further execution? One of the easier discrepancies to square away was that of where William Craig went after the pilgrimage to Hereford. Upon leaving the travelling party, he told them that he was off on a further pilgrimage to the Holy Land and was thought to have died some years prior. By all Welsh locals, however, he returned shortly after the Hereford pilgrimage and lived out his days in the same area that he was hanged in. It is not a stretch to imagine that the suggestion of a pilgrimage to the Holy Land was simply conjured up by William to allow him an easy departure from a family whom, despite having invoked a saint to apparently resuscitate him, had arrested him and hanged him in the first place. So what did happen on the scaffold? Was the knot improperly tied, allowing William Craig to survive, despite all that he appeared? Or was there, as suspected by the locals, but finally rejected by the Pope, a miraculous resurrection after all? If he had simply survived, how had he done so? And why had Lady Mary decided to invoke the aid of St Thomas de Cantaloupe in the execution of William Craig over any number of other executions, one even on the same day? Medieval stories are full of complex intrigue, mystery and myth. Even in the case of William Craig, with such consistent and well-kept records, 
we are still left pondering some pretty large questions on the entire affair. Just how had a man been put through a brutal hanging only to wait over 12 hours later? So William Craig, the not quite so hanged man. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's a really banger of an episode. I love medieval history anyway. So, you know, we haven't actually gone back this far for a really long time. So I really kind of, it just stuck out to me that it was an episode that I really wanted to do this week. Um, I thought it was a great story. And quite a, well, we'll come back to it after the ads, but quite a difficult one for me. But yes, we will come back to all of that stuff after these short ads. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, we need to, you know, run a few ads. So by that end, we've become an official affiliate with Audible. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service where you pay a monthly fee and with that fee you get a credit that you can spend on an audiobook of your choice. It's actually quite a good service and I'm a member of it myself so I'm quite happy to have it as a kind of advert in Dark Histories despite the fact I don't really like adverts because I just think it's a, a good service that's a decent value for money. The basic deal with Audible is that you get a credit once a month that you can spend on an audiobook and if you cancel you keep all your books which is quite nice they don't take any of your stuff away um you I, I routinely start and stop my subscription when i when i don't need to use it basically and all my books stay there they have an app on ios and android and i do believe windows as well so you can always listen to it on any device and they all sync up as well which is pretty handy if this sounds at all interesting to you and you're interested in trying it out then head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories and you can get a one month trial where you get a free audiobook of your choice. At the end of the trial, if you don't like it or you think it's not ready for you, you can cancel it and it'll, you can keep your free audiobook. And by using our affiliate link, we get a small kickback in the process which helps to support the show. So it's win win for everyone, really. So if you are interested, that link again is audible.com forward slash dark histories. Or if you prefer, go to darkhistories.com, check out support, and you'll find a link there that leads directly to the trial page. Thanks very much. Ads are a pain in the butt, right? Of course, you can hit that 30 second skip button, and that's all cool. But a much cooler way of skipping the ads is to sign up to the Dark Histories patron. You get a bunch of different benefits for doing so, including ad-free shows, access to early release episodes, the full back catalogue of bonus episodes, including the live stream archive and all the other bonus content. You get access to all my research notes for each episode and you get the added bonus that you're actually a part of the show, helping to keep it independent and sustainable from as little as $1 a month. So if you think that might be something you might be interested in doing, hop over to darkhistories.com and you'll find the support page with all the details to get involved. Thanks very much for not skipping this and giving my hard sell a listen. Let's get back to the show. Welcome back. So, yeah, quite a difficult one because this story is the sort of thing that normally, not necessarily I would write it off 100% as fiction, um, but it's normally the sort of story that I would be incredibly skeptical of um, and I would almost instantly, my mind would instantly go to, okay, who is fit, who's set to profit out of this situation? Who wrote this book? Uh, or you know pamphlet or leaflet or report or whatever it is and what do they fit to profit not necessarily financially but you know um like in the case of um it was a ghost one ghost story we did and it was written basically by a guy who was a spiritualist so you know you can see he had say not necessarily financial kind of motivations but um, sort of preaching motivations he wanted to push his faith so you know and the, and the story backed that up so i always go to things like that you know how is the person that wrote this set to profit but in this case it, there, there is no one that that's set to profit that the report is completely independent like the people there were people for sure that that were going to profit from this 
um, for for starters, that the um, the bishops of Hereford um, Cathedral were were absolutely going to profit from this because, like they said, I, um, I, they, they, it, a sort of pilgrim cult had sprung up, um, and that led to a lot of people, obviously a lot of foot traffic coming to the cathedral, but they didn't just come and you know bring kind of trade and stuff to the area in, in terms of like economics that way and donations and whatnot. They also bought wax effigies and things like that to leave at the shrine. And wax was a, a really big uh, commodity in um, the medieval period. So they were actually valuable as well, like really valuable. And um, there was, uh, I think it said there was 1,424, I think it was, um, wax offerings that they counted, like figures and such that had been left at the shrine. It was over 1,400. It shows that they were that valuable that, that there was a, a legal dispute over who owned them at one point because um, I, I didn't really read into that, but there was a legal dispute over who actually owned these um, these wax figures. So yeah, they they were certainly valuable. So there were people who were gonna profit out of this for sure, but none of those people had anything to do with the the inquiry. You know, the papal inquiry. None of them could even influence it, really. None of them were there. None of them were called as witnesses. And the people that did the inquiry, you know, they didn't really care. Or they didn't really care who they were can- canonising, if you like. Because, you know, there were no shortages of applications for people to be canonised. So if they'd have said, you know, if they'd not done this one, they could have just picked another one any time. It-, it didn't matter one way or another to them who they were actually canonising. They they weren't attached or affiliated with the church at all. They were entirely independent. So really, like, no one here was going to profit out of it. No, There was no reason to big up this resurrection. And that, that freaks me out. <laughs> because normally I, I'm, I'm, I can find something like, oh, okay, well, this guy's going to profit quite heavy out of this, you know, and, and that, my, my, I find my comfort level again because it's like there, there's a logical explanation for things. But in this case, there, there really is no one that's going to profit from this. That, or no one, sorry, like I say, there's, there is people that are going to profit, but no one who had any of the decision-making process, no, no one who, who gave any of the, none of the witnesses, none of them, none of them were going to profit from it. So it's, very strange. Uh, now, obviously, saying that, I'm not going to say that sit here and say that he was resurrected because, I mean, for starters, I'm I'm not religious, so it's not that I don't have an open mind about religion, but it's that this is a big step for someone <laughs> coming from my point of view, you know, going from being like not particularly religious to believing in divine intervention and. and uh, you know, a saintly resurrection is, is a big leap. So I'm, I'm not really prepared to sit here and say that he was clearly like a saintly resurrection. But clearly he was dead. I mean, if he wasn't dead, he was in a bad state. And that does, to some degree, the only bit about this whole, all the evidence and everything, the only bit about it that makes me feel, like, say, like back in my comfort zone is the fact that it took him like 10 days to recover after he'd come back to life. You know, one would think that if it was like a divine intervention or, or, or some miraculous resurrection, whether or not you believe it's religious or, or some sort of miracle, you know, anything, such so as some sort of bizarre freak of nature, whatever you believe, it, it's, it's, it seems strange that he didn't come back, you know, chipper and 100% on the ball. Instead, he came back like an absolute mess, basically, which leads you to believe that Okay, so perhaps he did really get kind of hung, hanged and he just managed to survive. And, and that works for me for a bit until you think, well, hang on, he was hanging for like 12 hours. And if he was hanging for that long, well, it actually was longer than that. How long was it? It was, you know, it was about 12, no, about nine hours. He was hanging for nine hours and he was hung, hanged twice. So let's say, he survives the first hanging, right? What's he doing? Like, just pretending to be dead? And what about when he falls off of the thing? Then they hang him back up. Hey, what? 
If he's conscious in any way, that is a nightmare, nine hours. Can you imagine that? Nine hours where you're like basically hanging from a scaffold, knowing that you're on the very verge of death because whatever saved you was probably like, say, the knot was not in the right place or something on the noose. You know, just a slight blow of wind or, you know, just, just isn't going to take much and you will be dead. So that, what a nightmare scenario that must be, being like, if he was even remotely conscious, that is a terrifying situation to be in. But I don't know if he was conscious because, say, nine hours is a long time to be hanging. And then he was carted off into town on the back of a ladder. And the whole time, people, no one went, oh, hang on, he's just closing his eyes. He's, he's pulling our legs. But then that leads you to think, okay, so if he wasn't conscious then, did he get kind of part strangled? Like half a strangulation? Half a hanging? Is that a thing that's possible? I mean, I'm sure it is, but then surely you'd have to look at, you know, blood being cut off from his brain doing permanent damage. And it obviously didn't do permanent damage. It obviously did short-term damage to him. I mean, they said that he was covered in blood and it was all up his nose and in his mouth and his eyes had come out of their sockets. So he did all of that stuff and he wasn't dead. So you would think, well, he can't have been conscious because imagine being conscious, bleeding out of all your orifices, <laughs> Pissing and shitting yourself, your eyes are hanging out of your head, and you're sitting there thinking at any moment you could be dead. What a nightmare scenario. I mean, you just, I'd rather just hang in that state. <laughs> but I, I still come back to if he wasn't dead, what was he? I mean, it certainly sounds like he was at least half dead. I, it's a strange one, this one. So I, I'm not going to sit here and turn around and say, okay, I believe that it was resurrection. I can't quite go that far. All I'm saying is, I don't understand medically what situation he was in. That it to me is something I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. And it, yeah, I, I would be thrilled to hear from any listeners that are, have a medical background um, that might be able to explain this one because it would, you know, make me feel a lot more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on that note, we'll certainly be talking about this in the live stream and I'm sure loads of people will be telling me I'm a moron um, and that clearly he just wasn't dead. So, you know, I look forward to that. But yeah, anyone with any sort of medical background, come to the live stream and explain because for me, he's... He was pretty much dead, you know, like he, he was, he was well on his way. And I don't understand how you can, unless like he was fell into a coma or something. I, I don't know if that's the thing. Like, you know, if you can be like half hung and fall into a coma, but it was never like, like the noose was never going to kill him, but it was going to limit his airflow or something like that. Like so much so that he sort of fell into a coma. That sounds like it could possibly be plausible. You know, and if that's the case, maybe a lot of the things would have happened, like like the voiding of his bowels and the bleeding of his orifices. Um, you know, maybe all that stuff could have happened. Whatever it was, he was obviously, you know, very lucky. It would be all too easy to sit here and say, oh, these people are going to profit, so they bigged it up, and none of this stuff actually happened. You know, it was all just a, 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 fi a figment of someone's imagination, um, and the story was greatly exaggerated but it doesn't seem like it was in this case this is one case where you look back and you think no none of this stuff seems like exaggeration you know none of none of these people have much to sort of benefit out of this it, it just seems bizarre to me um so yeah i mean on that that's where i kind of stand on there and i say i would love to hear your opinion on it so you can get in touch with me obviously uh, contact at dark histories if you want um or say we'll definitely be talking about this on next week's live stream so come along and, and get involved on that but to get back to the questions so one of the other more kind of fascinating questions is what what was lady mary doing caring about this guy you know what relationship did they have and that was really interesting i, I found one website that was sort of like it sort of said the obvious like you know um it would be a great story if you were writing a book to say that they had some kind of romantic attachment or something like that. And she was kind of saving the day. 
or trying to save the day. But the reality is it, it, it doesn't really seem the case. But no one really has any answers for that, which is really interesting because I guess no one, there is no answers because, the, in, you know, no, no, she didn't say anything in the testimony. They didn't really ask her in the testimony. It wasn't really part of the the inquiry. That, that wasn't really what they were interested in. So they, they just didn't ask her. But it is interesting. Like, why was she so bent on saving him? Like, she just called him a brigand and all this um, and a malefactor or whatever. But the reality, say, like, was that he was actually, you know, caught burning her castles and houses down and things like this. So what, why suddenly did she have some sort of sympathy for him? Uh, you can say that, but the, the, again, the, the sort of only thing that made sense to me really was that these ladies were often petitioned and um, they sort of tended to do it almost as a sort of keeping up appearances sort of thing, like um, to show they had like sort of power over their husbands and it was almost like a, a keeping up of appearances. So I, I can see that. And, and the fact that she was kind of loosely related to St. Thomas, the fact that she was loosely related to him, she would have kind of not profited, but it would have certainly that worked in her favour for people to know that she was related to a saint, you know, or, or a miracle working saint at that. But but why this particular guy? You know, she could have picked any other guy. Maybe maybe that's exactly why it stands out. You know, she could have picked any other guy, but she didn't. She just happened to pick this one, and maybe that's what makes it stand out. Um, but but it's but it's interesting. You know, what? Why did she? I I, I you, your mind, or, or at least my mind, instantly wants to run away with the, you know, the question of well, did she know him? Was, was there some sort of, if not romantic involvement, just any sort? What what sort of involvement was there? You're you're instantly kind of tossed down this fictional pathway of, of kind of conjuring up all these ideas of maybe he was a castaway from their family or a long lost brother in law or an illegitimate child or you know it's all of these kind of things. But obviously the reality is probably it was just coincidence and and, and she just uh, decided that there were two people being hung on this day and therefore perhaps she could exercise some of her authority over her husband or, or she could at least try. That was probably more to do with it. But it's interesting. I did find it interesting. saying it does certainly lead your mind to kind of romanticise down all these kind of fictional alleyways. So yeah, it's a, it's a great story, I thought. I, I think I'm probably going to leave it there. I don't really have a lot more else to say on it except from that, I say I state my position and, and you guys feel free to chip chip in with yours and, and get in touch with me oh yeah and in regards to the emails i've taken down our contact form because it was just giving me loads of grief so now it's just um you can go on there on the, and, and find my email address and just email me directly and um, the email is contact at darkhistories.com if you want to do that but the other way which would be much more fun would be if you come along to the live stream and um, we did have a live stream last week and it was a bit of a nightmare because we've just Basically, we used to use Google Hangouts and it was discontinued. So we've had to kind of um, find new software to use. So last week was the kind of first week of using this new software and trying to get to grips because I really wanted to keep it. I wanted to find a software where I could just give out a link and anyone could join So that because I really want to like the idea that anyone can just join the, the conversation whenever they want. So I, I really wanted to find a, a software that would do this the same as Google Hangouts did it. And I'd say I found one, but it just took a week or so of getting to grips with it. So this week should be much smoother. So yeah, come along if you want to. Um, and we're going to be talking about this. Um, so if you have a medical background, I would love to know your thoughts on this. If you have any experience of hanging people also, actually, no, if you do have experience of hanging people, just don't come on the live stream. <laughs> or at least don't tell anyone on the live stream. I don't want to be culpable. Um, so yes, anyway, um, Come along to the live stream, um, have a chat about it. It's going to be great fun. The live streams are, are totally casual. They're, they're just kind of informal chats. Um, everyone's welcome to chat either. It, it, they're on YouTube and, and there is a chat box where you can write and you're welcome to write away. And if you want, you can um, actually come onto the stream. Say I'll put a link in the description of the YouTube um, stream and you can just click that and it will just throw you straight onto the stream and you'll come on and you, you know, the video and, and, audio chat with us and um, all you need is basically a pair of headphones you do need a pair of headphones because otherwise it cocks the audio up heavily um but otherwise you know just a pair of headphones a crappy mic like something that came in the box with your phone will do um 
and everyone's welcome. I say there's no real barrier of entry. I try and make it as easy as possible to get in um, because it's nice to chat with everyone. Um, so yeah, come along to that. Details of that will be chucked out on the social media, so keep an eye out. And if you'd like to know any of the social media, your best bet is to go to darkhistories.com. You'll find all the links to the social media there, as well as, say, the email to contact me there. So yeah, thanks very much for listening. Oh, and on this week's live stream, we'll also be doing a t-shirt giveaway for the reviews. Um, if you can't make it to the live stream and you did do a review, never fear. You know, if you miss it, we will contact you um, about who won the t-shirt. So don't, don't, don't fear. But come along to the live stream anyway, because they're a lot of fun. Anyway, enough of my jibber-jabber. Thanks very much for listening. It's a great story again this week. I really enjoyed it. So I hope you really enjoyed it. S- say every, every, Maybe I say this every week. I don't know. It's always just a great pleasure to share these things with you, because I, 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 I love them. Um, and it's nice to share, isn't it? So yeah, thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you either next week at the live stream or in two weeks for another episode. So until then, take care. I hope you have a great couple of weeks. Sleep tight.